History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No, it's deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the father of the California wine industry. So I guess I wanted to start today's episode by talking about why I chose this topic. Because you like wine. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course. So this will be our second wine-related episode, I suppose, behind the champagne during World War II. Right? I don't think I've done any other. We've talked about it. Related ones. Um, it's come up on other podcasts, but these are the only two that are like wine-centered topics. Well, nonetheless, a wine episode for you. <laughs> I do want to announce the bittersweet fact that this is going to be my last episode hosting History's B-Side, at least as a full-time host. Hopefully, I'll be back on in later months to... When I drag you back on to guest host some episodes, <laughs> kicking and screaming. And I'm going to make them all about wine. <laughs> <laughs> So buckle up, listeners. They're all going to be four hours. <laughs> but we, uh, yeah, I do go long on the wine ones. But I wanted to do one of my, I don't want to say favorite figures in the wine industry, because I don't know if he's like my favorite, but he's one of the most interesting, I think. And when I was researching, he reminded me a lot of some of our other topics, like Jim Bridger, where, you know, part of his story was a lot of legend. And it was long enough ago that there wasn't a lot of documentation to tell fact from fiction. And he also reminded me a lot of the Kazik of Poyers. <laughs> and I can't remember his name now. Either. Gregor McGregor, the best name on history's B-side. Gregor McGregor, that's right. Yeah, he reminded me a lot of him in the desire, I think, for recognition and this kind of flamboyant, boisterous personality that our topic today had. And again, kind of like Gregor McGregor, you couldn't really tell fact from fiction, <laughs> but for, I think, maybe different reasons. I don't think Augustine Heresty, which is our topic for today, was openly dishonest. I think he probably bent the truth a lot, but I, he didn't trick, you know, hundreds of people into <laughs> sailing across the world dying and dying on a beach. <laughs> and we talked about that even a couple weeks ago with Stetson Kennedy that we weren't really sure how much of his story was actually true to him that there was a little right. bit of truth in the whole thing but you know parts of it might have been folklore as was appropriate to him and he was much more recent history than like Gregor McGregor or Augustine Horesty. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think those types of personalities just lend themselves to a certain mystique and unless somebody's paying a lot of attention to them during their life, it's easy to get facts wrong or assume facts that don't exist. And I think a lot of that happened with Augustine. I think it's funny that a lot of our B-siders can be grouped into either attention seeker or attention avoider. And kind of for both reasons, they become B-siders. Yeah, there's there certainly were a, a handful of them that almost wanted credit where it wasn't due and wanted to appear larger than their own lives. And then you have others like Roy Disney. Yeah. Like Roy Disney who didn't really want to be in the spotlight. And I feel like some of our topics are the exact opposite. <laughs> Augustine being one of them. So I guess this might seem kind of confusing, but I wanted to start today's episode off by listing the things that Augustine was not that, many people believe him to be that he espoused himself to be just mostly to get them out of the way because there wasn't a good place later in the in the episode <laughs> to explain all the other things because he told a lot of stories and and did a lot of things too but after his death a lot of people assumed he did a lot of things that weren't necessarily true before we get into the things he did do i wanted to begin by talking about the things he didn't 
Although he was born to a noble Hungarian family of modest means, he did not hold the title of Count. And for a lot of his life, he referred to himself as the Count, whether it was Count Augustin Heresty or the Count of Buena Vista, which is the winery he would go on to found. And, you know, people in his life, he was an important figure for a lot of people. And during his lifetime, people did give him the honorary title of Colonel, though he never officially earned that rank, nor did he you know, inherit the title of Count. So that's one of the first kind of myths or legends about him that isn't true. When you say a noble Hungarian family of modest means, what does that mean? Because I I would take those two opposite directions. Like nobles, probably wealthy, modest, probably not. I I think what that means is that they were modest for a noble family. (laughs) Um, Okay. You know, they weren't, they weren't, at the top of the noble hierarchy above like the upper Habsburgs middle class in <laughs> yeah yeah they're like they're like lower upper, upper class. middle class or middle <laughs> middle class i don't know they weren't peasants but they certainly weren't the most wealthy of the nobility and they weren't a high enough rank of nobility to afford a title they're the people at the country club who only have a pool membership <laughs> new money <laughs> <laughs> Who only have a pool membership. They can't afford the golf. Right. Legend also says he was a royal Hungarian bodyguard and the private secretary to the Archduke Joseph. But there's no evidence of either of these things being true. And it's not even clear if he, you know, claimed these things to be true himself or Mm. if it was later biographers or ancestors of his. He claimed to be a political refugee of Hungary when coming to the United States, but this wasn't really true. Um, He mostly came to the United States for the superior opportunity and came by choice. And it's also very widely believed that he was the first person to bring Zinfandel, the grape Zinfandel to California and plant it. And this is again arguably false because there are earlier reportings of Zinfandel being in California. And also, you know, just the history of wine grapes in general is very messy and it's hard to tell, especially earlier on when we didn't really know the science behind vine growing, hard to tell what type of vine you're growing and what type of grape it is. So even though this, you know, he might have claimed this to be true and his son claimed this to be true. It's probably false. So all this stuff that he is not, that's stuff, like stuff that's not true about him, I'm, ass- I'm assuming you're going to get into all of it, but it just seems very kind of random and all over the place as to what his background could be. Yeah. It is, and that's why I wanted to include some of this stuff at the beginning of the episode, because I'm not going to get into his claim that he was a royal Hungarian bodyguard, nor am I going to get into the claim that he was a private secretary to Archduke Joseph. I think the point I wanted to make here is that he claims to be a lot of different things. And he was a very, like I said, boisterous and colorful individual who really did pursue a certain mystique that that he wanted to show the world. And I wanted to begin kind of by getting this stuff out of the way um, because it does seem random and it is kind of random if you don't understand what type of person Augustine was, and he would have been the type of person to claim all of these things, even though they seem Mm. kind of far-fetched for one person. Yeah. He almost reminds me of like a Monty Python character or like the princess bride where he's like, so (laughs) over dramatized that he seems kind of like a cartoon. (laughs) I mean, is he like this, like has history made his story more of a legend than how he really was? I think so. I think he truly was a very colorful individual, but his background as a pioneer in the wine industry certainly lent his name to a lot of false stories. You know, the winery that he founded is still around, and not that they necessarily mistell his story, but there are people today who have some stake in enlarging his story beyond what it actually was and so i do think over over the years his story's been retold and kind of exaggerated so he is in a way like mountain man jim bridger where a lot of what he did was incredible and was really important but 
the full extent of his accomplishments isn't really known. But despite these shaky legends, he did found the first craft winery and built the first stone winery buildings in California and brought European Vitis vinifera grapes to the state. So what's significant about these grapes, the Vitis vinifera? So in the wine world, there's two main kind of species of grapes that we talk about. And the first is Vitis vinifera and the other Vitis labrusca. And the prior Vitis vinifera is what we know of mostly as wine growing grapes. They originated in Southeast Europe or the Middle East and spread with the Romans and those are, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, pretty much any wine grape you've heard of. Wait, did you just say that wine, these wine grapes started in the Middle East and were brought to Rome? They, the earliest known viticulture we have was in Georgia, the country. Oh. Um, and so viticulture, which is the process of growing grapes for winemaking, kind of began in the middle east and east asian states and then was spread via the romans to france and germany and the countries we now think of as having these huge historic wine cultures Hmm. but all of those grapes were of this certain species vitis vinifera when colonists got to the new world to what we now know as the united states they started growing local grapes Um, such as a grape called Catawba, which is a Vitis Labrusca. And they make wine. You can make wine out of them. I mean, theoretically, you can make wine out of anything that has sugar and acid in it. But a lot of, you know, a lot of smaller wineries even today in the Midwest and Eastern states will make grapes out of Vitis Labrusca, or will make wine, will make wine out of Vitis Labrusca. But it's not known to produce high quality wines or very well balanced wines or wines that will age. So the like craft or premium wine world primarily focuses on Vitis vinifera. And a lot of the origins of wine industries in California and Washington and Oregon and other states kind of start with the planting of those European Vitis vinifera vines. So if I buy a five dollar bottle of whatever from a grocery store that does not sponsor this podcast what type of grape vine am i drinking i i mean it does depend it depends on what winery you're getting them you're getting them from i know for a fact that there are wineries in ohio that operate to this day that produce a catawba wine I'm talking about like the cheap stuff, like the mass produced but cheap stuff. The mass produced stuff is pro- it's probably still Vitis vinifera. It it probably I mean it has to be legally it has to be 75% cabernet sauvignon for them to put that on the label. So even barefoot or, or <laughs> you know yellowtails cabernet sauvignon has to have that that type of grape in the bottle. It's not to say it's like well farmed or no, no, well no. produced. Five dollar wine is fine wine in this household. But we will get into that later because I know I know for a fact that you're going to ask what uh, what a craft or premium winery is, and that's going to come into play later. So I'm glad you are drinking. Is that barefoot? Is that what you it's have? It's not barefoot. It's wine label that does not sponsor this podcast. <laughs> so. That's basically what's significant about Vitis vinifera. And a lot of what Augustine Harrisley did for the California wine industry was provide access to these different grape varieties, which we will get into later. He also founded the first incorporated village in Wisconsin and was the very first sheriff in the city of San Diego back when it was only 200 people strong, which also seems kind of (laughs) random. But... Again, we will get into it, and it's part of the story of how he ended up in Sonoma. His life was, of course, one of stellar highs and deep lows. Augustine was born on August 30th, 1812, in Pest, Hungary, to Caroly, which is Charles in English, Heresty, and Anna Maria Fisher. The Heresties were one of the oldest noble families in Hungary, but were not titled. He received a classical education and could speak five languages. 
His father had a small estate in the southern part of Hungary in the plains area called the Baxka, the agricultural heartland of Hungary, which included vineyards, but the area was not known for making great wine. There is no record of exactly what grapes Harris these raised, but the area had Olaz Riesling, which is a form of Italian Riesling, and Churfendil, a red grape now thought to be Zinfandel, as well as Kadarka, which is a dark-colored red wine grape grown in Hungary and Romania. So he actually came from a family of winemakers? This wasn't something that he kind of just picked up on his own? I don't know if they made wine. They, they grew it, for sure. And it's okay. kind of to be assumed that if they were growing it, they were at least making some and holding it back for the family because that's just what you did in Europe and right. do in Europe. Um, and also not to downplay this, but a lot of people in Europe are winemakers because it's it's just part of the culture. You know, there are people that are winemakers that aren't full-time winemakers. Right. I mean, it, it almost seems like it could be... I'm sure it's more than just like your typical home brew type thing that you do in small batches as a hobby but like there probably are a lot more of the people that just kind of make their own home wine and then only make it for themselves to drink not that they sell it or distribute it or anything like that right so like i said this area ba Baxka wasn't a particularly good wine growing area but it was close to the celebrated tokai hegalia region where the world-renowned tokai wine is made and I don't know if our listeners will remember this, but the episode we did on Elizabeth Bathory with Fancy Town Crimes included a small portion where I talked about Tokai wine because it is of Hungary. Which you did not share with the rest of us. I didn't. It I'm... was kind of hard to share with the rest of you. <laughs> One of them was on a spoon. <laughs> and we were all the way across the country from each other. <laughs> But yeah. I was actually thinking about that episode reading through this because I know we're like 200 years apart from when those these stories took place. But just the noble upbringing in Hungary made me think back to that old episode. Yeah. So how is the Hungarian wine industry? I didn't really know that they had a wine industry at all, I guess. Yeah, I mean, a l most... I would say most European nations, if not all of them, have some form of viticulture and winemaking present in their culture, simply because of the influence of the Romans. Um, it's kind of hard to find a country in Europe that doesn't produce some amount of wine. I will say that until relatively recently, meaning the last 10 to 20 years, a lot of the Balkan countries like Slovenia and Croatia and Hungary and Romania didn't have huge wine industries. Almost everything they made was considered table wine or daily drinking wine. It wasn't meant to sell abroad or export until, you know, Americans and other countries decided that they were really interested in the world of wine <laughs> and, and kind of pursued a, a certain demand for these lesser known countries. So even though it had a later start than a lot of countries, and even, I mean, the United States probably preceded Hungary as far as having like a booming wine industry, Hungary and the surrounding countries do now make a fair bit of wine and export some of it. The Hungarian wine industry itself is largely centered around that dessert wine, Tokai, but there is a lot of really lovely dry, especially white dry wines coming out of the country. Um, there's a grape called Ferment that makes a crisp, mineral-focused white that's really delicious that I've seen around. And they also have a red grape that's not unlike Pinot Noir, but is a little bit spicier mm. called um, called Kekfrankos. So those are kind of the only wines I've had from there. It's certainly not as widespread or widely exported region as Italy or France or Germany even but they do have a pretty significant wine industry at this point. Got it. Besides making wine and growing grain, the family estate also raised silkworms to produce silk. <laughs> In 1833, at the age of 20, Augustin married Eleonora Dedinsky of Polish descent. It was considered by both families a desirable match. Their first child, Gaza, was born 11 months after the marriage on the family estate at Bax County. The couple went on to have a total of six children. The other children's names are Attila, born in 
born 1835 in Box, Arpad, born 1840 in Futok, Hungary, Ida, born in Illinois in 1834, Bela, born 1846 in Wisconsin, and Atela, born 1848 in Wisconsin. So, Spoiler alert, they moved to the United States <laughs> since they're having children in Illinois and Wisconsin and Hungary. The aristocracy, in, the aristocracy in Hungary was absolutely tradition bound at the time and rarely made changes in social or economic life. Most changes had to be approved by their overlords, the Habsburgs in Vienna, Austria. Young Augustin found this to be stifling. He had dreams of making a name for himself. And this is kind of where we see the beginning of his larger than life ideals and trying mm -hmm. to elevate his name. After reading the writings of Count Istvan Szczynyi, who wanted Hungarians to throw off the old feudal ways, and reading about America in an 1834 book by Sandor B. Farkas entitled Travel in North America, and meeting an English naval captain and two Americans, Augustine convinced his cousin Carolee Fisher to accompany him to America, leaving Eleonora behind with two children and pregnant with a third. He considered the United States as the land of opportunity. So, not a great move for a dad. <laughs> it's definitely not stellar. It, I think it does show a, a certain priority towards the elevation of self. Like, I think it's certainly possible that he could have made a fair living in Hungary as a noble family for his children but his eyes were a lot bigger than his life well I mean this is also looking back from like a present viewpoint if we're going to use our caveat of it was the times it probably would have been seen as more important or noble for him to seek out this opportunity versus being present as a father <laughs> which right. is from our lens not great but it was the times yeah. It was the times. So he takes off for the United States, and his first stop was actually in London, where he was amazed at the vitality and wealth of the English capital. The two eventually landed in New York and made their way to Wisconsin at the end of April 1840. The Wisconsin Territory was the frontier of the United States then, and a land of opportunity. Feels like Wisconsin's kind of a weird place to end up, but I guess if that was the American frontier, that would make sense that they end up there. <laughs> yeah. Do they like have a wine region in Wisconsin? So they do make wine in Wisconsin. As far as I know, they attempt at least to make wine in every state. I don't know if they do in Alaska or or Hawaii. They but... make ice wine, isn't that a thing? They might make ice wine in Alaska. I don't know. I should probably know that. I, I feel like at this point, it's popular enough that every state has some form of wine production, even if it's not consequential or high quality. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin does have a few approved American viticultural areas, which is basically the government's way of delineating wine regions in the United States. Uh, most of them around the Mississippi River, but... I've never tried any Wisconsin wine. <laughs> and oh, I don't know if they produced it at this time. You know what? They make champagne in Wisconsin. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. The champagne of beers. Miller High Life. Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> so anyway, now I want beer. <laughs> so after traveling through the woods, waterways, and prairies... They discovered a beautiful spot about 26 miles northwest of Madison, on a high hill overlooking the Sauk Prairie, where the Wisconsin River flowed past. Struck by this gorgeous panorama of nature, he named it Septage, which is Hungarian for beautiful view. Paying just $400, he purchased the best spot of land. <laughs> Millennials can't buy houses because they're eating avocado toast, Matt. No comment. I don't know what the inflation on that is, $400. <laughs> I imagine it's probably several thousand, if not tens of thousands at this point. <laughs> After purchasing the land, he found an investor, Robert Bryant, who had the capital to help him found a village, which he, of course, named Harrisley Town. <laughs> Harrisley Town is now named Sauk City. 
which is the first incorporated village in Wisconsin. Do you know why it was renamed? <laughs> Probably because he left and stopped claiming <laughs> it for his own. And they were like, why do we have this town named Harris the Town? <laughs> it's also just hard to say. <laughs> If you've been to Wisconsin, it's full of towns that are hard to say. That's fair. With his financial partner, he began an amazing number of businesses to attract settlers. A grist mill, a sawmill, a brickyard, a store, a ferry, and a steamboat, as well as a hotel. <laughs> That's a lot of businesses. It is. <laughs> Does he just afford all this with his family money or like how's I he think funding a lot all this? of it? I think a lot of it came from Robert Bryant, this investor. Because oh. I feel like if he had an enormous amount of family money, he wouldn't have needed to find an investor. But it is a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's really into, like, I mean, I can't even figure out how to write a business plan for one business that's good enough to <laughs> ask for investment. This guy's out here like, I'm going to start an entire town and you're going to fund it. And Robert's like, okay. Well, on that note, I mean, we're on like episode 55 or something if anyone wants to invest in history's b-side <laughs> send us an email we'll, we'll name it after you <laughs> and then buy a steamboat <laughs> <laughs> augustine also planted a vineyard for himself as well as grain similar to his family home as a farmer he raised pigs horses cattle and sheep selling the wool to others all of this development took about two years Augustine then returned to Hungary to bring his wife, children, and parents to the New World. I like also that he like comes here and spends two years setting up this like crazy life and then is like, all right, now I'm going to go back and get the rest of the clan. Hey, honey, I built a city. <laughs> we own seven businesses, and I'm not sure any of them are going to be successful at this point. Where are we going? New York City? Nope. Wisconsin. Land of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> partly to promote his new village in wisconsin augustine wrote a 550 page book in hungarian about his adventures entitled utazas ezak american bond which translates to travels in north america like the book he read that inspired his travels this sounds like poyes doesn't it it kind of does like right it reminds you he's like hey you guys should come it's really great which is the, the Native real Americans made up love land. Europeans. <laughs> Poyes or Wisconsin? We'll have to visit both and find out. I've been to one. Yeah, Poyes is great. I'll let you guess which one. <laughs> <laughs> so, this wasn't just a journal of his travels from New York to Wisconsin, but also included some imaginary characters and a fanciful account of Indian life on the Great Plains. <laughs> So it is a lot like, like Gregor, uh, McGregor. Gregor McGregor. He praised the American institutions and values. For example, one could travel freely throughout the different states, something you couldn't do in Europe. Plus, there was liberty and democracy. So, I mean, I feel like I've heard these themes before. Do you think this is still kind of a common sentiment about America for Europeans or I mean, people in other cultures? Like, there's obviously some negative perception of Americans in other countries, but I think there's also a lot of this we're still viewed as this like bastion of freedom in other places as well. I think it, I think maybe it depend just depends on the culture you're coming from. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. It was, I think it depends on what country you're coming from. I don't know numbers and names off the top of my head, but I feel like most of Europe at this point has been democratized in some form. And so I don't know if it's a it's necessarily true of people coming from European countries. It might be true of people in Ukraine. I was <laughs> at thinking this that. point in time. <laughs> That's the exact um, moment. But I think it depends on the quality of the government where you're coming from. There are certainly countries out there where the United States is still a major improvement over the conditions there. But there's also now many other democracies to choose from. Right. But I, I do think like we take it for granted, but the United States still has a fair degree of freedom um, compared to even some other democracies. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound like, I don't know, blind Americanism that we think we are this pinnacle of freedom, but 
there are certainly other countries and cultures that kind of view us in that light maybe not 100 percent to the patriotic perception we give ourselves but i don't know I, there, there are certainly worse countries to live in <laughs> yeah no i think it's okay to admit that the quality of of our democracy has been for a long time of an elevated degree i think we should be careful with how much confidence we take away from that because <laughs> I think, you know, democracy is kind of this balancing act that could tip at any moment. So yeah, do it that way you will. <laughs> I mean, while we're referencing a bunch of old episodes in this one, because it's long anyway, and why not? We had the same conversation in our Dietrich Eckhart episode that we talked about how democracy is fragile and like people can quickly change that. And then when you reference Ukraine, like I thought about same thing, like that's a place in Europe right now that maybe they don't want to be in the United States, but like are probably wishing they had a more stable, structured government. Yeah. And yeah, we I mean, talked about were... them being like the last army to still use the Maxim gun, which yeah. is kind of scary right now. <laughs> well, yeah, they, I mean, they had desires to join NATO and become a democratized Western nation. So I think you could definitely say that at least some Ukrainians desire to be more like the United States and Western countries. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole other episode. Yeah. Conversations on very current events. Check I'll out the New York Times. The Daily. <laughs> <laughs> so this book he writes is only the second book ever written in Hungarian about the United States, which is kind of bonkers. Yeah. He was probably hoping for Hungarian immigrants to come to Harris the town <laughs> because, you know, they would recognize the name, I suppose. It was not Harris the town. <laughs> There's no way. That's what he called it. <laughs> that is what he called it before like they changed it park. to Sock City. That's why they changed it. <laughs> Either way, he again left Hungary in 1842. Arriving in Heresy Town, <laughs> the family lived in a house that he had built. Then Augustine threw himself energetically into promoting all of his business ventures. He became a U.S. citizen on July 18th, 1843, and was a staunch Democrat. Historically, this is not a great time to identify as a Democrat. <laughs> it's definitely not. It's kind of surprising... Although I don't know what the, the racial conditions in Hungary were like at this time. Yeah, or in Wisconsin for that matter. Fair. <laughs> it was the frontier. <laughs> Anything went. Despite having worked hard to establish his new home, the Wisconsin winters were not kind to Augustine's European grapevines. They simply could not withstand the cold Wisconsin winters. When gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in 1848, he decided to leave Wisconsin for California. Although he was behind in his debt repayment and had some health issues, neither of these would account for the rather sudden decision to leave for California. It is speculated that perhaps the warmer and more suitable winemaking environment in California was found to be most attractive to him. He wanted to settle, not go for gold. So did he at least bring his family this time he moved? He did. He brought oh, them along. <laughs> he didn't go establish Heresty City and then bring them. <laughs> I suppose it, I don't know, is it easier at this time to cross from Wisconsin to California versus the Atlantic? It's got to be easier to go across land. I don't know. I mean, this is still around the time of like Oregon Trail Days where it was pretty, pretty brutal. I yeah. don't know if you could say it was easier. I think it was just different. Right. But we'll get to that story after a short break. We'll be right back. Oh, no. Matt's gone British. Oh, good chaps. Lock in the history, are you? Matt's promised to do the rest of this episode in this poorly represented British accent, unless you go support the show on our website right now. Oh, bollocks. Got myself into a pickle. But seriously, we just wanted to take a minute to tell you some ways you can support the podcast on our website, historiesbside.com. 
The first and most direct way you can support our podcast is by signing up for a membership. You can join at any monthly contribution level, but we suggest $10 to start. Though, please feel free to pick whatever fits into your budget. A membership will get you access to monthly bonus episodes, show notes, future episode cues, surprise gifts, and more. We also have on there our merch shop, which includes things like t-shirts, hoodies, hats, drinkware, bags, stuff for adults, kids, and dogs, so you can rep your favorite history podcast everywhere you go. You'll also find extras, including free stickers, bookmarks, and postcards. You can suggest an episode topic, or submit a question about the podcast, one of our episodes, or even about us. That website again is historiesbside.com. And now, back to the episode. All right, welcome back. So when we left off, we parted ways with Augustine Harris the just as he was about to part ways with Wisconsin on the way to California. So making his final decision, Augustine liquidated his holdings in Wisconsin and took a wagon train to California. He had five big luggage wagons drawn by 15 teams of oxen and a horse-drawn wagon that he drove. They began the trek about April 1st, 1849, crossing Iowa down to St. Joseph, Missouri, and joined the Santa Fe Trail. Then they crossed the Kansas and Arkansas rivers, and on several occasions shot buffalo for food. Passing through the Oklahoma panhandle, they entered New Mexico, arriving near Santa Fe on July 17th. So I know they're kind of traveling like southwest instead of northwest. But it really does sound like the Oregon Trail game, like taking yeah. these wagon trains and stopping to hunt for oxen. Uh, you mentioned earlier, like, did they take Bridger's Pass? They did not. Bridger's journey? Pass, I think, was in oh. <laughs> um, Wyoming or Montana. Well, they could have passed through it. Maybe I think they were further south than that before they hit oh, the Rockies. Okay. So no, I, I I definitely know, regardless of where Bridger's Pass is that they did not take it. (laughs) (laughs) But it would have been a similar journey to like what people were going through on the Oregon Trail. You know, we talked briefly before the break about whether it was harder than crossing the Atlantic. And I think it was still a pretty harrowing journey wrought with obstacles and, you know, a lot of hardships. I mean, looking at the timeline, it took them three months just to get to Santa Fe. And, you know, Ahead of them from Santa Fe was still the relatively unknown Gila Trail that they needed to take to San Diego. And that historically was the most difficult leg of the journey because of the desert that it passed through. And dying of dysentery while you play the game. (laughs) Luckily, nobody that I know of, at least in Harris, these party died of dysentery or in the desert. (laughs) And they landed in San Diego City in December 1849 which at the time had a population about 600. So, I mean, it took them, what, eight full months to get to San Diego from Wisconsin? It's not a, not a small venture. Yeah. Again, Augustine got to business and launched a number of business and agricultural projects, such as a stagecoach line, a livery service, fruit orchards, and a butcher shop. He also planted a vineyard just outside San Diego, near the mission of San Luis Rey, with grape cuttings imported from Europe. On April 1st, 1850, the first election under the American system in California took place, and Augustine was elected sheriff and city marshal of San Diego. So prior to this, California was under the control politically of Mexico, and this would have been the first American election in the state of California. Okay. So he's, of course, as a newbie in the state, just elected sheriff and city marshal. (laughs) His father, Charles, was actually elected commissioner of city lands. So, you know, basically a year after they leave Wisconsin, they're already kind of politically and financially set up in the city, which is kind of impressive. Like, I don't know, I moved to Oregon and I didn't get elected sheriff. (laughs) 
Well, you didn't open 15 businesses as soon as you got there. That's fair. That was your first mistake. You've been buying too much avocado toast. (laughs) Gotta stop buying the avo toast. (laughs) It's the lemon juice for me. You put lemon juice on avocado toast? Oh, you should. It's really good. I don't know that I've ever actually had avocado toast. And a little bit of nutritional yeast? Mm. That'll get you going. That's why I own a house. (laughs) That's why you own a house. You also don't live where like a basic house costs six hundred thousand dollars. Shouldn't have lived in Youngstown. <laughs> Again, the vineyard did not do well. However, no, nope, that's not how I want to start that because it doesn't make sense. So he starts all these businesses. He's elected sheriff and city marshal, and he again tries to plant a vineyard. Unfortunately, the vineyard didn't do well because the weather was too uniformly warm all year long, which is why we don't see a lot of vineyards outside San Diego today. Those poor San Diegans. It's just too warm. (laughs) We can't grow grapes. It's always 80 degrees and sunny. It's the worst. It needs to be slightly rainy and foggy for most of the year, like in San Francisco. (laughs) A year later, in 1851, Augustin was elected to the California State Assembly. Eleonora, his wife, decided she wanted to return to New York for the proper education of the five of the youngest children. She ended up settling in Plainsfield, New Jersey, 25 miles west of New York City. Augustine was not to see her and those children for five years, which is pretty crazy considering the the harrowing journey they took to get out there. And she's just like, we're going to go back to New York. Maybe they just didn't like each other that much. (laughs) I mean, they were together for their whole lives. Spoiler alert, but. Except when I just, he moved away. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. He, he kept moved moving. away. In March of 1852, Augustine sold all his holdings in San Diego and bought 50 acres of land near Mission Dolores, two miles south of San Francisco, naming it Las Flores. So again, he moves because, you know, why not just keep picking up and moving? Right. He again planted an orchard as well as vegetables, grain, and grapevines. The vineyard was once again planted with cuttings from Europe. Unfortunately, the weather was foggy and too cold to ripen grapes. (laughs) He keeps trying. He ends up selling half of Las Flores to purchase new land. So, I mean, with how much he's moving around, it feels like he's not really giving his vineyards enough time to develop. And I don't know how vineyards grow. You would probably mm-hmm. know that way better than I do. But wouldn't it take like more time to actually know that the land wasn't right for growing a vineyard and producing wine? Possibly. I mean, here's the thing. I It's hard to tell from this point in time because we know so much about viticulture and winemaking. But... At this point in time, we know that it if you plant a fresh vineyard with new vines from cuttings like he was doing, it takes at least four, if not five years to get quality usable grapes off of those vines. So he certainly wasn't waiting long enough to see the true extent of of his vineyard's possibility. But it's also possible that like he was getting such terrible fruit off of these that he might have been right to move. Because even in wine country in, in California, there are, you know, hillsides that are better and worse for winemaking. He might have been in an area that just wasn't good for it. Mm. It's hard to tell this, you know, this far back if he was just being impulsive and not persisting enough or if he had genuine reasons to want to move. Okay. But ever the persistent spirit in 1853 he tried again in san mateo county at a place called crystal springs planting the mission grape and other and other vitis vinifera grapes on 640 acres in june of 1854 it was discovered that the land on which augustine had founded crystal springs in fact belonged to a domingo feliz so he was forced out of that property (sighs) besides the area was not good for grapes again too windy, foggy, and quite cold. <laughs> you just can't find that Goldilocks zone, you know? I realize this is an audio podcast. So I'm sitting here shaking my head because I'm so <laughs> annoyed with this guy. 
So, of course, Augustine makes claim to a new 640 acres. About this time, Augustine decided to get into the gold refining business with some partners, probably because he wasn't making any money (laughs) building a vineyard. He quickly learned about refining, especially since his father was a skilled chemist. In 1854, with the federal government establishing a mint in San Francisco, Augustine became the first U.S. assayer in California through his political connections, and his father Charles became assistant assayer. In 1857, he was accused of embezzling $151,000. Because of this, he had to resign his position at the mint and liquidate his properties to place funds in a trust during the investigation. It took until 1861 to finish the legal proceedings, but he was ultimately exonerated. So he was innocent? Yes. Uh, he was declared innocent after the investigation. Why? Did, do you know why he was accused of it in the first place? Is it the fact that he I, was moving around and buying so many vineyards? <laughs> it was just sketchy that he had all this money? I don't. I mean, I imagine his persona and background didn't help. He was still, I mean, he's still a Hungarian immigrant. So I feel like that alone. They trust the Hungarians. Him, I don't think they trusted any immigrants. I, that's yeah. kind of an American ideal from the beginning, right? <laughs> we're the melting pot because we're all from different countries, but we don't trust anyone. <laughs> we haze you with nationalism and racism for thirty years before we declare you a citizen. Thirty years is the refrain from quite a few different immigrant groups right now. Only thirty. Fifty, eighty. I don't know. I don't know what the average... (laughs) That's fair. Five years before this, in 1856, a fellow California representative, Mariano Vallejo, had invited Augustine to Sonoma to try his wines made from the Mission Grape. What is the Mission Grape? Because you mentioned that a little bit ago. Yeah. So it's a specific grape variety, also called Paez, um, mostly in Chile, but... Essentially, this was a grape that was brought to the New World by Spanish missionaries, hence why it's called the Mission Grape. Um, And this would have been, you know, one of the first grape varieties planted in California as the Spanish traveled to the Caribbean and Central America before coming up to California. Um, But today it's, I mean, it's still planted and made into wine. It's just not a very celebrated or in demand grape variety anymore but it is a european variety Hmm. impressed by vallejo's wines augustine bought a small winery that in 1840 belonged to mariano's brother salvadore from the current owner julius rose in 1857 dollars augustine paid rose eleven thousand five hundred dollars for the property that seems like a huge amount of money does seem like a huge amount of money Since land was relatively cheap at the time, he eventually expanded his holdings to about 5,000 acres. Most of it was not planted to grapes. He built an impressive villa and named the property Buena Vista, the Spanish version of Septage, Beautiful View. Today, it is considered the first premium winery in California, and it still operates. So it's the first premium winery, but not the first winery in California? Correct. Uh, I mean, what makes it different? Like, why is it premium? So to understand this, you kind of have to understand the difference between craft and commodity wine. Um, So for instance, I mentioned earlier Yellowtail and Barefoot. And essentially these days in modern times, we have an entire industry of winemaking that is considered commodity wine. So that's pretty much anything you'd buy for less than, you know, seven or $8 a bottle. And this wine is made not to express the land it's from or the year it was grown, but really to be the same year after year, the same way Coca-Cola is the same year after year. You wouldn't, you know, want to buy a bottle of Coca-Cola and have it taste different since it was made in 2021 versus 2019. The same with Barefoot. There's no vintage variation. There's no like single AVA or single vineyard Barefoot wines. They want their Cabernet Sauvignon to taste the same year after year because that's their brand. The same was true back then. Like I said, the Spanish missionaries had been making wine there for a long time. 
A lot of it was probably table wine of low quality meant to drink on a daily basis. And none of it was really sold as a, a luxury item or a, a crafted piece of food or beverage. This Buena Vista winery was the first time somebody had, you know, tried to make a, a higher end style of wine like France or Italy was making at the time that would oh, be considered okay. collectible or ageable. So that's the main difference. The land he bought seemed to have everything he wanted. Terroir, great sun exposure, and perfect weather. And terroir is a French word that means a sense of place. So the, like I was talking about, you can tell certain wines are from Sonoma and they taste different from those from Napa, which taste different from those from Oregon. Eleonora and the younger children returned to California in 1857 to join Augustin, Attila, and Gaza in Sonoma. First, Augustin bored two tunnels using Chinese labor into the side of the foothill and built a temporary wood press house. The first tunnel was completed in 1857 and was 20 feet wide, 7 feet tall, and 100 feet long. The second mm-hmm. tunnel was started in the autumn of 1858 and was 20 feet wide, 10 feet high, and again, 100 feet long. These tunnels became aging chais, keeping the wine at a steady 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And you might remember that the same thing happened in Champagne, where they were digging tunnels and this underground climate seemed to be ideal for aging wines. Eventually, around 1862, two limestone buildings were built at their entrances, made from the stone debris from the tunnel. These were the very first hillside tunnels dug in Sonoma. Augustine used Chinese labor partly to save money. A white worker would charge $30 a month for labor, while the Chinese worker costs only $8 for the same amount of work. He also believed that Chinese workers were just harder workers. (laughs) He was criticized for this by the chivalry wing of his own Democratic Party, who had been fermenting racial tensions when Augustine was in the legislature in 1852. See, though, look at that. Even the Democrat Party of the 1850s was still arguing for the American working class, as long as they were white. I know. Like like I said, immigration and taking American jobs probably isn't a new idea. (laughs) (laughs) Only this time, it's the Democrats who are (laughs) anti-immigrant. The winery was the first gravity flow winery in California. What's gravity flow mean? It's a style of winery. Essentially, you know, when you put grapes, you have to take grapes from the press where the juice is pressed out of them into a fermenting tank and then from the fermenting tank into barrels. And you can do that by pumping it. But that takes energy and time. Gravity flow wineries are essentially set up on various levels. So there's a top level where the grapes would be sorted and crushed. They then fall into a tank, which is on the second level. Think of it like stairs. Mm -hmm. So they fall into the second level to be fermented and then flow downhill again into a third level into the aging barrels. So it's essentially an early form of an environmentally friendly, energy conscious winery. (laughs) Augustine had the latest wine equipment and hired Charles Krug as winemaker. He also built a villa for himself on the property. Unlike his neighbors who planted on the valley floor, he decided to plant his vines on the hillsides without irrigation. Hillsides provided protection from spring frosts, which affected the valley bottom, and they made it possible to vary the exposure to the sun as well as the wind. And hillsides were less apt to be composed of heavy clay soil, which retains a lot of water. Besides, Sonoma received an annual rainfall amount of 25 inches, which was adequate for the vine. More watering would only dilute the intensity of the fruit. The European varieties of vines for Buena Vista came from his Crystal Springs property, including Zinfandel, according to a recollection from Arpad years later. In February and March of 1857, Augustine planted 16,850 vines. Wow. His first vintage in 1857 yielded 5,000 gallons, with wine selling for $1 to $1.50 per gallon. Wow, what a steal. Do you have any idea like what the quality <laughs> of this wine would be 
compared to something you get from the region today? Probably very poor. <laughs> At this time, we still didn't know a lot about fermentation science and agriculture, especially viticulture. And I mean, these vines, he said these vines were planted in 1857 in March and February. That would have been the following harvest. It was the same year. And like I said, vines typically need four to five years to mature into growing quality grapes. So compared to what we have today, it probably was pretty bad wine. But compared to what they were making back then, it was of higher quality than most. <laughs> Augustine also made 120 gallons of brandy and 60 gallons of Tokai, which he did not sell. In addition, he had 65 tons of table grapes to sell. By 1858, he added 40,000 more vines. Of these, 26,000 were European, known then as foreign vines, and 450,000 mission vines. By January of 1859, he added another 100 acres under vine. So he's planting a lot. Like, this is an enormous amount of mm -hmm. vineyard lands. For, for reference... The, the winery I work for now, our vineyard is 22 acres. So he's got like several times that already planted. Yeah. To supplement income from wine, he also raised cattle on the higher lands, planted 350 acres to wheat, and sold fruit from the orchards. Augustine was constantly experimenting with viticultural practices, wine blends, and dry farmed hillside plantings. Dry farming is essentially farming without irrigation, which works well for the grapevine if you water it too much. Like I mentioned earlier, the grapes get very diluted and you end up with a less concentrated wine. He also promoted using redwood for barrels, which was plentiful and cheap at the time. I am very curious as to what redwood aged wine would taste like, because I don't know that I've had Is that anything. not a thing anymore? Most wineries use oak. So that's what I thought, and when I, I mean, when I read your notes, I was like, Redwood, that sounds Californian, <laughs> so I didn't know if that was, like, yeah. still a thing for California wines, or if they don't do that anymore. I, I mean, there might be a winery that still does that, but for the vast majority, even if they're using American wood, they're, they're using oak. Hmm. Augustine also founded the California Viticultural Society, and in February of 1858 wrote a 19-page monograph titled Report on Grapes and Wine in California. This became the definitive reference guide to growing grapes and making wine for many immigrants. He insisted on using vinifera grapes. The report conveyed his enthusiasm for grape growing and ended with an exhortation for the government to get involved with winemaking. Eventually, his wines began winning awards. In 1860, Augustine entered the Sonoma County Fair, where he won first prize for the best white wine and the best brandy. At the 1860 State Fair, he entered 35 bottles from 1857, 58, and 59. He won six first place prizes and one second place for wine. This is Wines maybe bad because I'm from Ohio, but like, when I hear that this, like, famous winemaker from california is entering state fairs <laughs> it just seems very midwestern that that's like important it does i mean think about it at like the time it's, for him. it's yeah. 1860 like the state fair was probably akin to being on the news right but i took my wine down to the county fair or getting like high point scores from wine enthusiasts or wine spectators <laughs> At this time, wines were primarily made from the mission grape, and foreign wines would be blended in with that grape. Also, wine varietals were not written on bottle labels until the 20th century, so it's kind of hard to tell what these early wines were made out of, which is one of the reasons why Zinf like his claim to have planted Zinfandel first is so hard to verify. Despite these successes, Augustine was still not satisfied with his wines. He felt that Sonoma had the potential to become California's greatest wine-growing area. One of his ideas of improvement was to establish a horticultural society with a garden to raise trees, plants, and vines. The Sonoma and Napa Horticultural Society was incorporated by selling stock to investors. Land was purchased about a mile from the Sonoma Town Square, and corn, peaches, walnuts, and almonds 
were planted along with European vines. He offered to sell off portions of Buena Vista to small winemakers. For 12 acres, a fledgling winemaker could have a vineyard of 6,800 vines, with two acres left over for buildings and a garden, all for $2,140, which is cheap. If you wanted to (laughs) start a winery these days, complete with an estate vineyard, you'd need a million, if not several million dollars. (laughs) Yeah, I would think several. He also offered larger offerings to those who could afford it. Only three individuals purchased property in 1859, including his former neighbor at Crystal Springs, Charles Krug, and his former winemaker. However, the number of horticulturists began to increase, and by October 1860, there were 40 grape growers in Sonoma, including ex-governor William Boggs, General Mariano Vallejo, and Augustine's two sons, Gaza and Attila Harristi. So in doing this, he kind of like kickstarted the entire wine region in Sonoma? Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I think, this is his biggest accomplishment, not necessarily the having the first premium winery in California. That's just the easiest one to say. But for most wine regions, especially in the United States, of any consequence, including Napa and Sonoma and now Willamette Valley here in Oregon, there was a, a person or a group of people that, did all of this work. They petitioned the government to make it easier to start a vineyard. They brought grapes here. They made it possible for farmers to purchase them and grow them. The fun thing about most of the major wine regions is that they started as these small community operations, even Napa, which now like has major international investment started as a bunch of farmers kind of trying (laughs) just guessing, checking and sharing ideas with one another. And that I think is like, one of the defining characteristics of American winemaking is a a sense of ingenuity and innovation paired with a sense of community and helping one another out. In the winter of 1860 and 1861, he created a test vineyard to see which foreign grapes would thrive on the hillsides and in the California weather. Besides all his other projects, Augustine formed another company, the Sonoma Tool Land Company investing money to drain the marshland in San Pablo Bay and remove the dense reeds, called tools, and convert the land into farming land. He also helped establish a steamship line to travel between San Francisco and Sonoma. It could make one trip in about three hours. Hmm. As a member of the California State Agricultural Society, he had been working on a resolution for the legislature to urge the state to send a commissioner to Europe, to collect and purchase grape stock to bring to California. That commissioner was to write a report of his observations and have the state pay the cost associated with purchasing and shipping the vines back to California. The legislature accepted the society's proposal, with a few changes, and the governor signed the measure. So, in 1861, Augustine was appointed by the governor, John G. Downey, to a three-man commission to explore the best way to promote the grapevine in California, provided that the office holders did not ask or receive any pay. <laughs> Augustine interpreted this as he could ask for his expenses to be reimbursed, but would not receive a salary. He wanted to expand the diversity of wine grapes grown, find the best varieties of rootstock, and encourage winemakers to experiment. Augustine, Eleonora, and their daughter Ida arrived in Paris in July of 1861, where they joined up with Arpad. Arpad, their son, had been studying at Madison de Vinoge in Champagne. The Harristhes then went to Dijon and visited a garden with 600 varieties of vines. They went to Gevry and Chambertin, Bone and Cloge de Vigeau, and other areas in the Côte d'Or in Burgundy, taking detailed notes. And for those that aren't familiar with these regions, they're some of the best winemaking areas in the world, Okay, where some of the most expensive versions of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are, are grown. The family then went to Germany to explore Riesling vines. Then it was on to the Rhone Valley, Piedmont in Italy, and the town of Asti, where he tried both the still and sparkling wine, which we might know, like you've tried Yeah, I've had Asti. Asti. Then it was on to Bordeaux, where he visited Chateau Margaux and noted how closely the vines were spaced. 
They then left Bordeaux for Madrid, taking a horse-drawn diligence designed for 20 people through the Pyrenees Mountains. And from there, they traveled south to Malaga, where they made a sweet wine from dried raisins. So it's kind of like a grand tour of European wine regions just to collect information about the cultures and the practices, as well as possibly source grapevines. Sounds fun, even though I would have no idea what anything is. It does sound like a dream trip. As far as I'm concerned, (laughs) I would die. Returning to Paris in October of 1861, Augustine alone traveled back to California. Eleonora and their daughter Ida remained in Paris for a while, while Arpad resumed his studies in Champagne. Augustine's vines did not return to San Francisco until January 23rd, 1862. So this is a couple months later. All of them arrived in good condition, transported by Wells Fargo. He had purchased 100,000 cuttings and 350 grape varieties. A catalog assigning a number and listing the grape varieties is filled with names unfamiliar to the modern reader. For example, vine number 265, a Melvoise d'Aragon from France, is unknown today. What does that mean, unknown today? Uh, That they, outside of a handful of small villages in France, it's not made to any consequence anywhere. So, like, you couldn't buy that wine anywhere? No. Oh, okay. They, I don't even know if they still make it in France. I, they make so much wine in France that I hesitate to say they don't. But it's certainly not made to a commercial quantity. So when you say unknown, it just means like it's not a specific variety that we like variety of wine that we would recognize. Right. Okay. More familiar grape varieties were Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Riesling. Chardonnay, which at the time was not identified as such, but probably was included in with champagne grapes. Carignan, Gewürztraminer, Merlot, Muscat, and Semillon. Many of these varieties are staples of a modern vineyard today. Despite claiming that he was the first to bring Zinfandel to California, that name, Zinfandel, was not among those listed varieties, but could have been hiding listed under some local name like number 418, Red Silvani. Augustine had borne all of the expenses himself, including travel, cuttings, and shipping, amounting to $8,457 just for vines, and over $1,000 for shipping. A motion to reimburse Augustine was presented to the legislature, where it died in committee. That's terrible. Do you have any idea what, I mean, in today's dollars he would have spent on this trip? So it's estimated that $10,000 in 1860 is worth $338,732 today. So it's likely that he spent at least a quarter million dollars, if not well over that, funding this trip. Pretty significant chunk of change to not get reimbursed for. Yeah, pretty pricey. But the original commission specifically stated that the commissioner would not be paid. When a vote was taken, the mining counties outnumbered the agricultural counties, and their vote followed the original provision that no reimbursement would be made. This was a huge financial blow, and Augustine had to take out three large five-year mortgages. Three! Three mortgages! (laughs) (laughs) Nonetheless, the 1862 importation of vines was a significant event in the history of California wine. Augustine's initiative promoted the fact that winemaking was an economically important industry and only Vitis vinifera should be used in California. However, his dream of a European-like state-sponsored botanical garden where vines could be made freely available had been rebuffed. What does that mean, a European-like state-sponsored botanical garden? What I mean, what do they have in Europe that's like that? Yeah. I mean, the major regions in Europe, because they're so well established and have been around for so long and are essentially centers of culture, have these nurseries where you can go to buy cuttings. Whereas here, I mean, now we have those same things. But at this time, during Augustine's life, they wouldn't have had a nursery of grapevines that you could just go and pick out Pinot Noir and Cap Sauv and Zinfandel and then take it home and plant it. So I think that's kind of what he was after was a little bit more variety and ease of access. Okay. Which is what Europe at the time had. Right. 
Having not been reimbursed, Augustin began selling cuttings to the general public himself, building up stock on the more popular grapevines. He wanted to keep improving Buena Vista, but was unable to continue sinking capital into the company by himself. He had $93,000 in three outstanding mortgages at the time, which is so stressful. I can't imagine having $93,000 in debt today, and we're talking at a time where this is probably close to a million dollars. I mean, I have more than that in debt technically, but obviously not in eighteen sixty dollars yeah. <laughs> And that's true. If $10,000 was close to 300000 then we're talking nine times that. So like... Like Two point seven million dollars. <laughs> Look at us doing math. I hope that was right. Ooh. It's close. <laughs> in 1863, he converted Buena Vista to an agricultural corporation with stockholders, selling six thousand shares at a hundred dollars a share. It was renamed the Buena Vista Viticultural Society. This was a risky venture for him. Augustine would now be under the scrutiny of other stockholders who could question his actions, and Augustine only owned 43% of the company. The money was used to make improvements. A 50-horse stable, a small railroad to run grapes up the side of the hill to the second story of the press house, pipes, pumps, and machinery for a distillery, as well as a champagne house. Augustine was the superintendent in charge of everyday operations, while his son Arpad was hired as the champagne maker. In 1864, Augustine traveled to New York to meet some of the investors in the Buena Vista Viticultural Society. He addressed the American Institute's Farmers Club and spoke about the wine industry in California. By 1865, the Buena Vista Viticultural Society had 645 acres under vine, but trouble was brewing. A series of financial reversals had accumulated. Arpad's first champagne vintage did not sparkle, and the board fired him. (laughs) Embarrassed, Augustine reimbursed the Buena Vista Viticultural Society $6,000, which was a costly mistake. In 1864, a drought lowered production, and the federal tax on brandy went up, and the price of wine went down, while the cost of improvements became more expensive. Augustine, who had studied vine spacing during his trip to Europe, undertook to change the traditional spacing at BVVS, where vines were spaced apart eight feet on center, which is pretty far. The garden at Dijon in Burgundy had done studies and determined that the optimal spacing was just one foot apart. Augustine then decided that at Buena Vista, optimal spacing should be four feet apart. He decided to achieve this by a method known as layering, which involves digging a hole, bending an already existing vine into the hole, covering it back up, and exposing two of the buds to the air. Eventually, in about three years, the cane buried in the ground will grow its own roots while it still has nutrients from the parent plant. At that point, the link could be severed and the vine could sustain itself. So basically, you're bending a grapevine into the ground and eventually cutting it in the middle, creating two separate grapevines. You may wonder why Augustine didn't just plant a cutting in the existing vineyard. And it was because just putting a cutting down in a mature vineyard has a high failure rate as the already established vines start to kill off new plants. (laughs) But the layering method had a greater survival rate because you're relying on those plants to support the new growth, at least for a period of time. I'm a terrible gardener. We try to do a vegetable garden every year um, behind our garage. And we get some peppers, not enough, not very many. Peppers and tomatoes, about all we can do. So I can't imagine any of this stuff. You've really lost me on planting vines and everything that goes on here. It's intense. It's a lot of stuff. I don't even fully understand some of it. (laughs) If he repeated this process annually, about seven years in, the entire acre could have the new tighter spacing of four feet apart. Instead of the usual California method of 680 vines per acre, you would end up with 2,722. Hmm. His neighbors thought he was crazy, but he defended his position in a February 1866 essay of California Rural Home Journal. Planting closer together would avoid the problem of grapes of low sugar, poor color, and less flavor, essentially concentrating them. It would also help poor farmers who had little monetary resources get the most out of their acre of land. 
Despite this, these assertions caused a lot of controversy among Californian winemakers who were used to tradition. In 1866, he returned east to Washington to successfully lobby Congress to lower the tax on brandy and wine. Now, he's done all of this stuff for the California wine industry, pretty much helped bootstrap an entire industry in Sonoma, and been a part of petitioning the government for more friendly tax policies. Unfortunately, his final years get kind of depressing. Augustine was spending less and less time at Buena Vista, no doubt distancing himself from the enterprise, aware of his growing debt and significant problems at the vineyard. Buena Vista had never made a profit, and there were questions about the vineyard management there because of the practice of layering, which at the time many critics felt was foolish. Buena Vista had 5,000 acres of land, but most of it was not under vine. One bit of good news was that Buena Vista had finally produced a first-class, quote, champagne, but this had taken three years to achieve. And we know from our previous wine episode that this wouldn't have been actual champagne, right? Because it wasn't grown in France. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It was just sparkling wine. So you said it it took three years to achieve this. How long does it normally take to produce a first class champagne? I mean, a lot of them take about that long. Three years isn't really outside the normal realm. So is it just that they were kind of like strapped for cash and needed it to come around quicker? That I think so. It taking three years was the bad side of it. They were trying to produce it too quickly, and the three years just took too long for some investors. Right. Most devastatingly, the Phylloxera grape louse, which is a parasitic bug that essentially kills grapevines, began to noticeably infect the vineyards of Sonoma in 1866. As early as 1860, Augustine had noticed the occasional vine had wilted and that the roots looked diseased. It took a long time, however, to identify just what the cause was, because phylloxera would move on when the vine died and there was no evidence left behind to see. During all this time, Augustine took out loan after loan, using the only security he had, his Buena Vista stock. Finally, he simply had no more stock, so he filed bankruptcy in 1867. Mm -hmm. On January 5th, 1869, his petition for bankruptcy was fully discharged. At the age of 54, he had little to show for all of his work in California. That's really sad. Like he... I know! (laughs) <laughs> put everything into making California a wine region and they kind of just didn't give anything back to him. Yeah, they were like, here's your bankruptcy papers. <laughs> Thanks for the vines. Yeah. I'd be so mad if I was him. <laughs> Definitely not a not a deserving ending for him. Buena Vista eventually hired a new superintendent, Emil Dresel, who had a nearby vineyard. Dressel was convinced that the cause of the vineyard wilting was due to Augustine's layering. He thought the crowded conditions led to weakening of the vines, and so began pulling out all of the layered vines. However, since Dressel had no real understanding of why the vines were dying, this didn't solve the problem. So it was just the phylloxera that was killing them? It wasn't the yeah. layering process? It was not the layering process, it was the phylloxera grape louse. <laughs> Ever the entrepreneur and opportunist, he never gets down, this guy. (laughs) Augustine's next venture involved leaving the United States for Nicaragua. This time, his plan was to raise sugarcane and distill rum to sell in the United States (laughs) and make enormous profits. He's like a guy who just has all of these big ideas on how to make a quick buck. And like, actually, some of them worked out well, but... I didn't know making rum was a get-rich-quick scheme. Maybe at the time it was. (laughs) In February 1868, Augustine and Gaza took a ship to Nicaragua to examine the country. The country was a tropical paradise full of orange, papaya, mango, and cashew trees, as well as coffee and cocoa plantations. This sounds like Poyais. It does sound like, I mean, it's kind of close, right? (laughs) It's, It's a neighbor... Obtaining new capital and getting exclusive rights from the Nicaraguan government to distill brandy and rum for 20 years, Augustine began building facilities. He asked Eleonora, who was still in Sonoma with her children, to join him in the hot, humid, dangerous jungle environment. (laughs) Poor Eleonora, she's just following (laughs) this crazy dude all around the globe. Indeed, 
two months after she arrived, Eleanor died of yellow fever, oh, contracted no. by a mosquito bite on July 15th, 1868. Isn't that what happened to uh, Alfred Wallace's dentist brother? I think it so. wasn't really a dentist, but that's the joke that James made. I can't remember yeah. his name. Was it Herbert or something like that? Herbert Wallace. I don't know. I don't remember what his name was. But <laughs> <laughs> didn't his brother die of yellow fever somewhere in like Central America? I think he died of yellow fever. I'd assume it was somewhere in Central America. Might have been South America. <laughs> After Eleanor's death, Augustine had to travel to California to settle her estate. His 79-year-old father, Charles, wanted to return to Nicaragua with him, but he was not in the best of health, having contracted dropsy. Afraid that Charles would fret himself to death if he didn't come, he was allowed to accompany Augustine to Nicaragua, but the hot, humid climate aggravated his disease. Charles decided to return to California, but unfortunately died on the ship and was buried at sea on July 22nd, 1869, before arriving back in California. He needs to just pack it up and call it a career. Back in Nicaragua, Augustine was planning to build a sawmill on the banks of a river. But when he got to the site, he wanted to move the mill to the other side of the river. To do this, he needed to talk to the foreman, but the foreman wasn't around at the time. So deciding to wait for him, Augustine took off his oilcloth coat, as well as another coat, and laid them down on the ground with his watch presumably to take a nap while waiting. But he never returned home. When his family came to find him, the coats were on the ground, and his mule was tied up with his pistols still in the saddle. But there was no Augustine. Since an alligator had dragged a cow into the stream a few days before, it was speculated that Augustine probably fell into the river and was most likely eaten by an alligator. (laughs) Wait. (laughs) What? (laughs) That's how... They believe he died, and I'm, I feel bad for laughing because it's tragic and probably terrible, but I'm ridiculous. He's he got eaten, by, eaten an by an alligator? This is like some Captain Hook shit. <laughs> is this, like, I, I don't want to ask, is this real, but like, is this real? Like, this is how people believe he died, or is this part of the, the legend you were talking about? I think this is how many people believe he died. I think it might be part of the legend. You know, they never found, other than the coats and the watch, none of his remains were ever found. I I think this, I I like that we're leaving it off here because I'm going to let our (laughs) listeners decide if you think he was killed by an alligator or just happened to die of something else. (laughs) I don't even know what to think about this guy. It's a very fitting end for such a ridiculous, like, bombastic character in history. Listen, if anyone is still listening to this podcast this far into this episode, the payoff was worth it. (laughs) (laughs) A little treat. You thought you were just going to listen to me drone on about wine for two hours, but no. I left you a cherry on top at the end with an alligator death. (laughs) Who doesn't love it? Oh, man. So, of course, assessment of Augustan heresy is difficult because one has to separate fact from the fiction of his legend. In the 1970s, wine historians have arisen who dispute that Augustan was the father of California viticulture. They say he was not the first who brought Vitis vinifera to California and certainly wasn't the first to bring Zinfandel to the state, as he claimed. If you remove all the hype, though, a number of facts remain. Augustine was a force of nature, a vital, energetic man who did a tremendous amount to promote wine in California. Besides his many writings, he brought numerous quality European vinifera grapes to the state, whether or not he was the first to do so. He promoted and modernized the industry while at the same time promoting his own self, but he believed wholeheartedly in the California wine industry, and during his life tirelessly promoted it. Until he was eaten by an alligator. <laughs> Cheers to that. Cheers to alligator death. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know what to think of this guy. Like, it, I think it's pretty clear that he was very important to what has become a huge industry, part, especially in America. But, I mean, you've told me before how the California wine industry has grown so much to be on par with that of 
France and Chile and other international wine areas, at least in quality, just doesn't have the history to it. So clearly, I think he's kind of at the root of that, no pun intended. But his story is just so ridiculous that I don't even know what to think about him. (laughs) It is pretty ridiculous. I'm kind of nervous for this quiz. by an alligator. (laughs) I know. Such a crazy ending. I feel like that's way more ridiculous than however Gregor McGregor died, even though I feel like his story was a little more ridiculous. He had a hero's death. He was like a celebrated as a war hero by the end of it. Yeah. (laughs) Is it bad that we are comparing him to someone who is an obvious liar and criminal and murderer in some sense? Maybe, but I'm okay with it. I feel like he, I mean, he. I, I clearly explained at the beginning of the episode that he wasn't an outright, at least I don't think he was an outright liar and certainly wasn't a criminal. He was just no, he, a man who liked to tell tall tales about himself. He doesn't seem like a bad dude in any sense. He just kind of was an opportunist and didn't know when to just take a break. Yeah. Call it quits. Well, you ready for some wine history trivia? I think so. I feel good about it. I tried to stump you because you know too much about wine as it is. I'm nervous. I feel like this is going to be harder than the champagne quiz. (laughs) We'll see how it goes. We'll take a quick break and then we'll get into that when we come back. All right, Matt likes wine. Going through the whole history of it. (laughs) See how much he knows about it, because we're getting into today's quiz section, which our listeners know we end every episode with a short three-question quiz to test today's host, kind of see how much he knows about his topic or studied about it, that he can answer a couple questions sort of around the main topic, and then maybe you listeners, if you know some of this, you can play along as we go. How confident are you? This is your area of expertise. That makes me slightly confident, but also worried that I might get something wrong. (laughs) So I knew that I could not stump you on anything about like how wine is made or the grapes or the vines or anything like that, because I think even me trying to research that and pulling an answer right off of whatever article I'm reading it's probably more likely that you're going to have the more correct answer than whatever I'm guessing is the right answer. So I tried to lean more into the history side of things or some of the things around Augustine Harris the, but I guess we'll just get into it and see how it goes. Ready? Let's do it. I feel good about it. (laughs) So your first question actually doesn't have a ton to do about wine itself. But you mentioned briefly about Chinese immigrants, which played a major role in developing the California wine industry. They were there building the wineries, planting vineyards, digging underground cellars, and harvesting grapes. And they were very involved, at least until the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited immigration from all Chinese laborers, was signed into law on May 6th, 1882, by which U.S. president? Oh, God. So this is more testing if you can guess what who was president in 1882. I can't. Oh, man. <laughs> See, I feel like if I guess, I'm going to show even more of my poor history knowledge because <laughs> I'm probably going to guess a president that wasn't even president. William McKinley. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a bit off on that one. Probably. I have no idea. Uh, So this is probably your hardest question just because it's like a random thing and you just have to know the year. But the president was Chester A. Arthur, who actually became Uh, president, I think, like the year before because of, well, he was the vice president and he kind of came into office. But anyway, I thought, the reason I include this because I was intrigued by this Chinese Exclusion Act because it was the first and actually remains the only law to have been implemented to prevent all members of a specific ethnic or national group from immigrating to the United States. Mm. Which, like, remember the whole hullabaloo about Trump's immigration ban or whatever that we were calling it yeah. when he first took office? Muslim ban, that's what it was. Clearly not really in the same vein, but this would never be something that could pass today. 
Right. All right. So we'll get more into wine for your last couple questions here. Number two, the Buena Vista winery is actually known as the second oldest winery in California. What is the oldest? Oh. Your hint is that it sounds like it's related to our B-sider today, but it's actually not. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so the winery is called Diagostini Winery, mm. which actually opened a year before Buena Vista. It was originally opened by a man named Adam Ullinger, who is a Swiss immigrant, but it was actually bought by the Diagostini family in the early 1900s. So that's it got renamed and it doesn't even have the original name that it did then. <laughs> so it's not related to Augustin at all. But I thought it was mm. funny that the names were so similar because he opened the winery the year after. And your yeah. third and your third question. Harris Thee was inducted into the Vintners Hall of Fame in March of 2007. Where is the Vintners Hall of Fame located? I'm going to say Napa. Napa Valley. That's correct. Can you be more specific? I'll give you credit for it. I'm just so curious. It's not in the, so it's, I'm going to assume it's not in the village of Napa because if it was, I feel like you would have just accepted that. I'm not as familiar with Napa. I'm going to read you exactly what I read. Is it Calistoga? I don't think so. You know this way better than me. <laughs> it's located at the Culinary Institute of America inside the barrel room at Greystone in the heart of Napa Valley. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head where that's located in, but I don't know. It said Greystone Winery, I believe. But it was interesting because it said the inductees are honored with bronze statues displayed inside of 2,200 gallon redwood wine barrels. Oh, all right. Maybe somebody <laughs> still is using funny, them. yeah. <laughs> and then I do have a bonus question for you because not related to wine at all, but I was so intrigued by the untimely demise of our b-sider today <laughs> getting eaten by an alligator and of course that didn't take place within the united states but your bonus question is according to the cdc wonder database on average how many people are killed by alligators each year in the united states <laughs> on average <laughs> Twenty thousand. Do you think 20,000 people are killed every year by alligators? <laughs> we would I not be like so that's... shocked by his death. Uh, I knew that was a ridiculous number as I said it. I almost said 100,000 and then I was like, that's too many. <laughs> 20,000? There's a lot of people in Florida. <laughs> 50. The correct answer is one. One? One person on average is killed a year by alligators. So alligate oh is percent. I thought it was number of people. No, one person per year on oh, average. Okay, it is one person. Okay. I thought you said percent. Um no. within wow. the United okay. States. So who knows if alligators <laughs> in Central America are a little hungrier, I guess. So you hear to hear if you drive or openly catch the flu or take airplanes you have no reason to be afraid of alligators because <laughs> all of those things are far more deadly <laughs> i mean don't mess with them but like <laughs> yeah, maybe it's don't very unlikely them. they're just gonna attack you don't, i mean consider the fact that the steve Irwin, who put his head like inside <laughs> of alligators mouths was killed by a stingray stingray yeah he didn't even get killed by an alligator <laughs> may he rest in peace didn't but expect still. to talk about Steve Irwin on this podcast. And Ukraine. I wanted to go out with a colorful bang, just like August and Harris. I mean, this was a long episode, but we were all over the place. Well, if you need to, I mean, if you're at this point, you figured it out. But if you need to listen to it in two parts, have at it. <laughs> it's going to take multiple parts to get through this. <laughs> As always, we really appreciate our listeners for taking the time out of their busy day to learn about history with us. We enjoy putting these together for you and are equally excited that you enjoy listening to them. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us at historiesbside at gmail.com. 
or find us on social media at Histories B-Side. And since it's fairly new at the time this, this episode's publishing, we have a website now, historiesbside.com. You can support the show on there. Obviously, we are sort of saying farewell to Matt, at least as far as being a regular host on History's B-Side, but the podcast will go on. We're happy to be here and bring stories to you. And don't worry, I will force Matt to come back and <laughs> guest host a couple episodes with me. Thank you all so much for listening to me ramble with Phil for what is this now 53 weeks 54 weeks 55 over a year you've listened to me on a weekly basis talk about history (laughs) which is a subject i don't claim to have mastery of and i appreciate that about each and every one of you (laughs) i look forward to uh guest hosting in the future and hope phil finds some solid b-sider hosts (laughs) we'll see how it goes thanks for listening History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at podcast at historiesbside.com. You can support the show by becoming a member or making a one-time contribution at historiesbside.com. While you're there, check out our merch shop, extras, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Molino and Philip Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.